Well, it's been quite a week of vicious attacks against Judge Roy Moore. The slanders and the lies that have been told about him are just beyond the pale. If you know the character of this man, it's the worst kind of attacks against him. Many elements of the tales that have been told are already falling apart. The yearbook with a forged signature, that one's been exposed. And the one who claimed that uh, he called her on her bedroom phone when her mother said there never was a phone in her daughter's bedroom ever. Or about the one that claimed that she couldn't get out of the car because the child locks were on seven years before child locks were invented and installed on cars. Or how about the, uh, the one who said that, uh, uh, that there was an event that took place in the restaurant parking lot behind the restaurant when there is no parking lot behind that restaurant. Uh, or the non-existent uh, uh, banning of Judge or Roy Moore from a mall, Gadsden Mall, and the, the person who manages that mall says that is a lie, that never happened at all. And on and on we could go as the details that these liars are putting in their slander are being exposed for what they are, lies in a coordinated attack against Judge Roy Moore. Many people rightly are asking about the timing of these attacks and questioning why four weeks before a special election when the events alleged to happen 30 to 40 years ago and he has stood for uh, election more than five times, statewide election, attacks should have come at those times and they did not or when he was running in the primary or how about the runoff with uh, Senator Luther Strange, all those opportunities, why now? Why now indeed? It appears that uh, the response is also suspicious of what we call the swamp creatures in Washington, D.C. Notice how they have responded on cue, as it were, calling for Roy Moore to immediately resign and quit the campaign because of these allegations, when there's no proof that any of these allegations are true at all. There's no evidence that any of these things took place. There are no eyewitnesses. There are no uh, evidence that can be presented other than the word of a woman saying this is what happened 40 years ago. Now if those swamp creatures in the Senate and the House held to their own members to the standard they're trying to hold Judge Roy Moore to, uh, we would see something very immediately happen like the expulsion of Senator Al Franken. Uh, it, what do we have instead of an immediate expulsion of uh, Senator Al Franken? Oh, they're going to investigate the charges of harassment against him. But what's there to investigate? You can see from the picture with your own two eyes, taken, by the way, by Al Franken's brother. Uh, they were in on it together. Uh, and it proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that he molested a sleeping woman. Or what about Senator Robert Menendez? Uh, why hasn't there been a demand that he immediately exit from the Senate? Why hasn't the Senate Ethics Committee gone after him and investigated him since there's a bundle of evidence of the criminality that he has been involved with? Uh, criminality in terms of accepting bribes and, and corruption of the worst thing, uh, worst level, as well as underage prostitutes. They have all the evidence. The Fed has that evidence. Why have they not called for him to immediately resign? Why have they not put him uh, under the ethics investigation. The accusations made against Judge Roy Moore are baseless. They are unproven and they are actually unprovable. There is no evidence whatever. Whereas uh, the jury that uh, was hung in New Jersey this, this uh, week on where the Meden Menendez trial, they had actual evidence that confronted them. But the head of the Senate, the president of the Senate, as well as of the House, don't they have a higher standard than simply a jury trial? Isn't there enough evidence for them to kick out these corrupt senators? And that's just the tip of the iceberg because after all we've had exposed this week that uh, Congress has 260 senators, representatives, and staffers on behalf of which we, the taxpayers, have footed a $15 million bill paying out to those who have rightly accused them of crimes that they've committed against them individually. We the citizens, and you know what? The Senate nor the House will reveal those names. They won't tell us who it is that has done these criminal actions that has cost the taxpayers $15 million. So McConnell and Ryan covering up for sexual predators. So it's clear 
if you look at the evidence, even as an objective observer, it is clear what's going on here is not about the allegations being made at all against Judge Roy Moore. There's no evidence for them. Outrageous allegations demand outstanding evidence, and there's none of that here in this at all. What we see in reality instead is a political assassination. That's what's taking place. A political assassination by means of the media. What we see is a last-ditch attempt by the swamp creatures, establishment Democrats, establishment Republicans, to prevent by all means Roy Moore from taking his seat in the Senate. They've even admitted that if he is even elected by the people of Alabama, they will take every measure they can. Uh, ethics investigations are just refusing to allow him to be seated. Is this unprecedented? What's going on here? It really reveals the heart of these swamp creatures, and they oppose Judge Roy Moore because of his stand on two things. His stand upon the Word of God, as the supreme law and is stand upon the Constitution. This is something those swamp creatures cannot tolerate and they have sworn that they will not tolerate. They will stop at nothing to accomplish their goal. They object that Roy Moore holds our founder's view of law and government, that there is a God, the creator God, the God of the Bible, that our rights come from the creator God and from him alone and that the only purpose of human civil government is to protect and secure those God-given rights. They hate that idea, and they don't want anyone with that idea to come into Washington, D.C. One of the talking heads at uh, Fox News, Juan, expressed it this way. He said his thought about the whole idea of Roy Moore being in, in the Senate was this. Why? He believes that God is above the Constitution. In other words, we can't ever let anybody into any position of leadership who believes that God is above the Constitution. Why does he believe that? Because it is true. There is one true God, and he is above all human civil governments. That is absolutely true. That's what the founders of our country believe to be true. Not only is God above the Constitution, but God's law, God's word, God, the Bible, this holy Bible is above all human man-made law, including our Constitution. And you know what? Our founders recognized that. They clearly stated that in the Declaration of Independence. In that declaration, they not only stated that there is one God, the Creator God, the God of the Bible, and that rights come from Him and the purpose of government is to secure those rights. They stated that what they were doing in creating this new constitutional republic, what they were doing was based upon the Bible. They say it right there in the Declaration of Independence when they use the phrase, the laws of nature and nature's God. That phrase, the laws of nature and nature's God, is the rationale for everything they were doing in separating from Great Britain, in creating a new government. It is the rationale underlying everything in the Declaration and everything in the Constitution of these United States. It's the opposite of a godless constitution. It's a biblical constitution rooted in God's word. The Bible, you see, is the rock upon which this constitutional republic was founded. Indeed, it's the word of God alone, and our founders understood this, it's the word of God alone that brings true freedom, that brings true liberty. If you don't follow God's word in your own life, in the life of your family, in the life of your society, you will not have true liberty. You will not experience true freedom. You see, it's those who choose to obey the commandments of God, the statutes of God, the testimonies of God. It is they who experience true liberty and true freedom. Think of a train for a moment going down the tracks. That train is fulfilling its designer's purpose and its designer's clear instructions when it does what it's designed to do and when it stays on the track, it experiences the freedom to do what it was purposed to do. And so if uh, we as mankind created by God, if we follow the design that he has given to us, his word, that is when we experience true liberty and true freedom. It is a false claim that freedom is to jump off the tracks. What happens when the train derails and it goes off the tracks? It destroys itself and it destroys everything in its path and it destroys all the people on board that train. It's a wreck. It's a disaster. It's death and it is destruction. 
And so it is for us as human beings if we reject our designer's plan for us, our designer's law and his testimonies, we will have a train wreck in our own lives personally and in our culture, in our society as a whole. We will be a train wreck if we reject God's law. And that's what's happened in our country. That's what's happened in Washington. That's what's happened in our state capital and throughout the state capitals across this land. Disaster, death, and endless grief come not to just people personally when they violate God's law, but come to a society as a whole when it violates God's law. I believe we have most of the swamp creatures there in Washington, D.C., and they've been elected by the people in America, either because they've deceived the people into thinking they really believed in a biblical understanding of law and government, or many of the American people want that. They want the violation of God's law. They want a godless America, an unchristian America, and that's why they've sent those swamp creatures to Washington, D.C. But the truth is that's not freedom. And a country will never experience freedom when they do that. They will only experience bondage, bondage to sin, to death, and to destruction. You see, true freedom comes from following God's commandments for us, His design for us. A true freedom is experienced when in our heart, joyfully and willingly, we obey what God has commanded us to do in our life. Our Savior, who gave us the great gift of salvation, gave us His commands for our good, for our blessing, and for our benefit. Now, when we speak about the founders of our country, it's clear that they were not perfect men. In fact, we need to confess that there are no perfect men other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And there will be no perfect people on this earth short of eternity. Many will criticize the decisions that our founders made there in Philadelphia in 1787. For example, the decision that they made to allow slavery to die a natural death and expire over the course of 20 years. Many criticized that decision in the Constitutional Convention. And there were actually some at that time who defended slavery and the whole idea of slavery. They said the Bible supported slavery and therefore it was legal. Turn, if you would, in your Bible to Philemon as we return to our study of this epistle of Paul to his disciple Philemon. Because the Bible says the opposite of that. Instead of slavery being God's design, it was liberty, it was freedom that is God's design from one end of the Scriptures to the other. The thing where Scripture diverges from those who wanted abolition in our country was that many of the abolitionists were demanding a revolution. They were demanding a bloodbath. They were demanding an uprising and so forth in order to achieve the liberation of slaves. And the scripture, we find this especially in Philemon, the scripture does not encourage that as a means of ending bondage and slavery, but rather the gospel of Jesus Christ will bring slavery to an end as we see here uh, in uh, uh, Philemon. By the way, when we study the history of the world, we find that slavery is in every culture, in every part of the world. And throughout the history of the world, slavery has been the norm. It is only when the coming of the gospel of Jesus Christ that the power of slavery was broken and broken uh, very powerfully uh, in, in the world as people came to faith in Christ and began to apply the, the true message of the gospel, which is a message of freedom. Freedom, first of all, individually from enslavement to sin and to, to the works of the devil, but freedom to be all that our Creator designed us to be means in a society there'll be freedom for the family and then freedom uh, for everyone in society. And let's look at what Paul writes here uh, to Philemon. Philemon verse 8. Wherefore, Paul says, though I might uh, be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, which he's, he's speaking about setting his slave, Onesimus, free, emancipating his slave, uh, though I might uh, uh, be bold in, in Christ and enjoining that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. Paul, he's saying here, could have commanded him to emancipate Onesimus, his slave. 
And that's based on God's law. We studied this uh, previously in Deuteronomy uh, 23 that if a slave escaped, if you had a, a runaway slave, the law of God was that you were not to return that slave to its owner. That slave, because of oppression and so forth, ran away from his master, and that slave was free once he ran away. That's how you were, the law of God was to treat runaway slaves. So based on that law, Paul could have commanded Philemon, look, your slave Onesimus ran away, therefore he is free. This is what the law of God says. But it's interesting, Paul doesn't do that. He doesn't command him, rather, to em emancipate Onesimus. Rather, he appeals to Philemon based upon the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice what he goes on to say in verse 12, Philemon verse 12. Whom I have sent, that is Onesimus, I have sent again, Thou therefore receive him that is mine own bowels, whom I have retained with me, that in thy, I, I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be, as it were, of necessity, but willingly. So Paul is saying that it would have been greatly beneficial for him to retain Onesimus there in Rome. See, Paul at this time was uh, under house arrest, that is, he was in prison, but it was not in a dungeon. It was in a house that he had rented, and he could not leave that house. So if he was going to get food, he had to have someone go buy food in the market for him, and he needed this or that. So Onesimus was very useful to the Apostle Paul in his condition of uh, un being under house arrest. And he's making, Paul's making this very large request of Philemon to emancipate his slave. But he says, Philemon, the decision is ultimately yours. I am not forcing your hand. I am not manipulating you and, and so forth. I'm just putting forth what the Word of God says, and I'm putting forth what my desire is, and I urge you to understand what God is calling you to do. So here is the liberty he's given Philemon to do something that really would be better to set his slave free or to choose that which is not as good, to retain his slave. And uh, notice what he goes on to say that has changed. Now that Onesimus came to faith in Christ, the whole relationship has been transformed. Look at verse 15. For perhaps he, that's Onesimus, therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Look what he's saying. He says, it may have looked like a disaster when he left because he stole money from his master. That's the evidence. And obviously just leaving as a slave was an enormous financial loss. So it may have looked like a loss, but Paul's saying, no, recognize that God was doing something in this. Just as we know from the Word of God that uh, he promises that he uses all things together, works all things together for our good. So even those things, as this case of financial loss, can be used of God for our good. Notice he's saying that the basis by which he also ought to emancipate Onesimus is that now that Onesimus has come to faith in Christ, he's a different man. He is now a brother to his master. He's no longer a slave. The relationship has changed. And this is the truth of the brotherhood of all believers. If we understand that we are brothers in Christ, no Christian would ever choose to oppress another fellow believers. Fellow believers do not treat one another as slaves. And again, we studied this uh, several weeks back in Leviticus 25, that if a believer becomes impoverished and gets sold into slavery to a fellow believer, that fellow believer may own their labor, but they must not ever treat them as a slave. They must not oppress them in, uh, as a bondservant. The brotherhood of believers is the truth that we are all equal in Christ. Jesus Christ died for each of us. And when we've come to faith in Christ, we have God's Holy Spirit indwelling us. We are equal in Christ. We are brothers one of another. In fact, the Scripture goes beyond that, just the idea that we're brothers. And it says that we're actually one body. We are linked to one another in a way in which we need one another. The body of Christ is composed of many members. Yet every member of the body is essential for the interworking of the body, for the accomplishment of what God wants to accomplish. And Scripture actually tells us that those members of the body that you might say are less noticeable, that is, they don't stand out as, as clearly as the others, they are the more necessary ones. They're maybe behind the scenes doing things uh, on an on on ongoing basis. I think of an example of this, if you remember back in March of 1981, 
President Reagan was, it was an attempted assassination. He was shot and he was hospitalized for several weeks. And what took place was that the vice president did his proper role and, and uh, uh, took, took the role of, of the chief executive. And really, when you looked at the running of the country, little changed. There was no major hiccups. There was no disaster that really occurred while he was recovering in the hospital. The government continued on as usual. On the other hand, just a, a, a while before that, maybe a couple of years before that, if you remember, there was a garbage collector strike in the city of Philadelphia. And that city quickly, very quickly, turned from a beautiful place to a stinking garbage heap, rotting garbage in the streets. And not only that, a very unhealthy condition because the sanitation workers all went on strike. And so compare the two. The president was recovering in the hospital, but the garbage strike was on and uh, the conditions of the country in terms of the president being in the hospital, not much change, but how important are those garbage collectors? Very important, although you might not notice them, or not, might not see them or consider them. They're certainly not a household name. You, you wouldn't know the name of the person that picked up your garbage on a daily basis. But if they're not functioning as they were designed to function, it's a mess for everyone. And so Paul reminds us that no part of the body of Christ can say to the other part, I don't need you. The eye can't say to the ear, you're not necessary, or the eye to the hand. Every part of the body is Christ. We are, uh, of the body of Christ is necessary. Every part is indispensable. And therefore, no Christian should ever look down on another Christian as lesser or lower or of less important. And Paul is reminding Philemon of this, that his former slave is now a brother in Christ and equal before the Lord Jesus Christ, just as he is. Look back at Philemon in verse 17, where Paul goes on to speak about the debt that Philemon himself owes to Paul because of Paul preaching the gospel to him, leading him to faith in Christ, and then discipling. Look at verse 17. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him, that is Onesimus, as myself. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, uh, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it, albeit I do not say to thee that thou owest unto me even thyself, own self besides. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. You see, he, he was saying to, to Philemon, uh, this brother, I want you to receive him just as if I was coming to visit you. The way you would treat me should be the way you treat him because we are brothers in Christ. Furthermore, if he's stolen from you, and the evidence is that Onesimus had stolen probably a large sum of money, not only to mention that uh, he'd stolen the labor that he was not delivering to his master. So there was a debt that was owed, and Paul's saying, I will pay that debt, Philemon, put it on my account. However, remember, Philemon, that there's a greater debt than that that you actually owe to me. What was that debt? That Paul shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with him, led him to faith in Christ, discipled him as a young believer. That was far more important than any amount of money. Why? It's what Jesus calls the pearl of great price. And if a, a, a person discovers in a field an extremely valuable pearl, he will buy the whole field. He will pay whatever it costs because that pearl of great price is worth it. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the gift of salvation. If someone has shared with you the good news of Jesus Christ, if someone has led you to faith in Christ, if someone has discipled you in your Christian faith, you owe them a debt, a debt that is enormous because the value of that salvation and discipleship is far beyond anything uh, that we could measure in earthly terms. You see, when we look at things from God's perspective and God's standard of what is valuable, the things of this world are small in value compared to the spiritual riches of life in Christ Jesus. Now look on quickly to verse 22, because notice here he is making the point that joy of the Lord unites the believers together in a fellowship of believers. He says in verse 22, having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. But withal, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. Notice what he's telling us here. He's saying that Philemon, whatever decision it is you make, here I'm, I'm presenting the evidence to you, I'm exhorting you and encouraging you to emancipate your slave Onesimus, but if you don't do that, no, what, 
whatever decision it is you make, I am going to come and visit you. I am going to have fellowship with you. Please prepare uh, your home for my visit. And so Paul was expecting to come and visit and spend a, a lengthy period of time, an extended visit with him in his home in the near future. Think about this. What is Paul expressing to his friend Philemon? Because this, I believe, is a valuable lesson for us as disciples of Jesus Christ. He's saying that we may not always agree eye to eye on every detail, on every issue. But the reality is that we have far more in common with one another as brothers in Jesus Christ than we have in disagreement with one another over any issue at all. Paul was willing to stay in the home of a slave owner. He was saying, I'm coming, I'm going to come visit. Even if you make a decision that I don't think is the best decision or the right decision, I still love you as a brother. I'm still going to have fellowship. I will still come and stay in your home. He's going to have an ongoing relationship with Philemon no matter how the decision was decided. The decision would not shatter their relationship. It would not cut them off from one another as believers in Christ. Consider today, if you would, how shallow many have in terms of what passes for relationships in our day. Someone doesn't like a post you placed on Facebook. What do they do? They unfriend you, right? <laughs> I'm no longer your friend. Well, you have to ask, how deep was that relationship anyway if they don't like a post you put up and therefore they unfriend you? I know many people have friends on Facebook that they've never met. They're friends of friends and friends of friends of friends and that sort of thing. And there's a whole collection of people on social media that have no real depth of relationship with one another at all. And uh, the, the whole thing of social media allows us to actually pretend we have these relationships. And they're really not uh, of any depth, of any significance whatsoever. And I think it's a trend that's taking place in our society of people atomizing that is becoming more and more alone less and less connected with one another. That ought to be the opposite in the body of Jesus Christ. We are brothers and sisters with one another. We are connected in the body of Christ. We belong together. And like Paul and, and Philemon here, there might have been a disagreement. We'll talk later about what Philemon ultimately did, but that's, we'll, we'll keep that for later. But if there was a disagreement and they went uh, uh, in, in two directions in terms of a decision, Paul was saying it wasn't going to affect their relationship. He was still committed to him as a fellow believer, as a brother in Christ. When we examine the book of Philemon, we get a clear message from the Word of God with a practical application that freedom is connected with following God's law, that slavery was never God's design. It was never a good thing. And why? The biblical principles of freedom are laid out from one end of Scripture to the other. First thing is that all man are created in the image of God. Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, all man created in the image of God. That is, all human beings are equal in God's sight. The image of God in which we were, we were made means that we have dignity as a human being. We have a destiny that's eternal. Uh, you know, I might disagree with some who say animals go on to live forever. That's fine. You might hold your opinion there. But I know for sure what Scripture says, that human beings are going to exist forever in eternity, whether in heaven or or in hell. Very clearly we have dignity as human beings because we're made in the image of God. We have a destiny and we have freedom. God designed us to have free choices. You see, when God designed us, He knew that ultimately we were going to choose or reject what His plan was for us and He left us that option, knowing that true blessing and true freedom would come when we chose to follow His plan, when we chose to obey his law. And because this is the reality, no human being should ever be considered a cog in a machine as part of a system, that, which is often how slaves are treated and often how they are considered. That should never be because they're a human being made in the image of God. They have dignity in the image of God. They have an eternal destiny and God designed them uh, to enjoy freedom. And freedom can only be fully enjoyed when we follow God's law. For example, if everyone in society decided they were going to disobey God's law that says, thou shalt not steal, what would be immediately apparent is we have no security for our property. In fact, there are cultures where that was the case and before Christianity came and more and more people became Christians, I read about the South America where everybody used to travel with their wealth with them. 
What was their wealth? Usually it was animals, farm animals. So they got a donkey, or they got a, you know, a goat, or they got chickens. And so chickens would be taken with them when they traveled on the bus because they couldn't trust leaving that chicken at home. Somebody would steal it. But when everyone, instead of disobeying God's law, began to obey God's law, well, you could trust that your chicken would be safe at home in your chicken coop. It wouldn't be stolen uh, by your neighbor. You see, freedom is experienced when people obey God's law and follow God's uh, commands for us. And each person, if we experience that individual obedience, we experience freedom within our own lives. And as a group of people and as a society uh, follow God's commands, then they also experience that freedom that God has designed for us. So because all men are made in the image of God, it flies in the face of the whole idea of slavery. Secondly, think of the commands that God has given to us, the two greatest commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second command, love your neighbor as yourself. That command condemns slavery. Because slavery is not loving your neighbor as you love yourself. If we love our neighbor, we're going to do for our neighbor what we would have our neighbor do for us, which is the exact opposite of what slavery is. And so when, when we consider just even those two commands, we find clearly that Scripture speaks against slavery. But also if you turn to Ephesians chapter 6, this is one of those passages, Ephesians 6 verses 5 and following, that people say, look, the Bible here approves of slavery. And I would argue, no, it does not. And instead, it, it is telling masters and slaves how to behave. And ultimately, if the master becomes a Christian and applies what God has commanded them, they are going to emancipate their slaves. But until they do so, here's what the command of God is first for the slaves, Ephesians 6 and verse 5. Servants, and that's the same word for slaves, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. That is, when you're serving your master, do it as if you're serving Christ. Not with eye service, as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ. There it is again, as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. So there's God's instructions for servants. They are to serve as if they're serving the Lord Jesus Christ instead of serving uh, their master. But notice the next verse. God gave the command to masters, and ye masters, do the same things unto them. In other words, what he's just commanded that the slaves do for their masters, he's saying the masters are to do for their slaves. What? Yes, the masters are to serve their slaves as if their slaves are Christ. They're to minister to their slaves. They're not to abuse their slaves. And he goes on to say, forbearing, threatening, in other words, uh, not, not having that attitude as a master, knowing this, that your master also is in heaven, neither is there any respect of persons with him. Notice what he's told us here. All of them are going to be accountable. Whether slaves or masters, they are going to ultimately be accountable to the Lord Jesus Christ, accountable to God. And therefore, slaves are to serve Jesus Christ, and masters are to serve Jesus Christ. And ultimately, as Paul has exhorted Philemon, if a master serves Jesus Christ, he will emancipate uh, his slaves. We are all accountable to God. I think of an example of a man who abhorred slaveholding, thought it was a terrible, terrible institution. His name was Robert E. Lee, and he never bought a slave himself. But through his wife, through the death of some of her ancestors and relatives, their family inherited a, a group of slaves. And he set about, as soon as that, that inheritance came into his family of slaves that he didn't choose to have or, uh, and, and didn't believe was proper to have, he set about emancipating those slaves. But he recognized that to do this, if he just set them free without the resources they needed, it would be a disaster for them. They would starve. And so he said there was three things that his slaves needed in the process of emancipation. First, they needed an education. They needed to learn to read and to write. And they needed to learn to do mathematics to be able to thrive in the economy. Secondly, they needed practical skills uh, which, uh, by which they could make a living, a craft or a, a profession or a trade so that they would not fall into poverty and that they would be able to provide for themselves and their families. Thirdly, they needed land. They needed uh, property where they could uh, have a family farm and raise a crop 
uh, to feed themselves. And Lee began working diligently to accomplish those specific goals. It was in the midst of that terrible, unnecessary war that he wrote his last manumission document, freeing the last of those slaves, having worked to accomplish those three goals for them. But he had opposition to what he was doing. In fact, it was against the law in his state, the state of Virginia, to educate slaves. And so basically he was violating the law because he said, I know the higher law, God's law, and this is what I'm following, God's law. And so there were those who were uh, seeking to bring him into uh, the justice system of that state and accuse him of violating the law by educating slaves. And when confronted and threatened with a judicial action, he defended what he was doing in this way. He said he had not set up a school, which is what the law forbid. You could not set up a school to teach slaves. He said he had not set up a school. Rather, he was homeschooling his extended family. That's how he viewed his slaves. It was what the, Paul's exhorting Philemon to have this attitude towards his slave. They're your family. He's your brother. He's not your slave. So he was simply homeschooling his extended family. And because homeschooling is the jurisdiction of family government, it is beyond the state of Virginia to say what he could or could not do with the homeschooling of his own family. Praise God. He was a Christian man who got the message of Philemon, got the message of all of scriptures that would set the captives free. When we study the biblical doctrines regarding freedom, it's very clear that God was opposed to, to slavery long in the past. After all, read the book of Exodus. God set the children of Israel free from their 400 years of bondage, and God showed that he hated and he condemned slavery. Then we see the law of God regarding bondage that was given at Mount Sinai, that if someone became impoverished, that uh, and they, they were basically bankrupt. They could be sold for their labor, but they were not to be treated as slaves. Believers in that system under the, the commands of Mount Sinai, they were to be set free from their bondage uh, at the seventh year, the Sabbath year, or at the year of Jubilee. And I believe largely Israel followed these commands that God had given them regarding slavery. How do we know that? All around them. The cultures were practicing slavery. In fact, as I said, the history of the world shows that slavery has been in every part of the world. And yet when we read the prophets of the Old Testament, they condemned every evil, every form of oppression, every form of violation of God's law that Israel engaged in over the years. But it's interesting, studying the prophets, you'll find they never said a word about slavery. Think of that. If there's all these other evils that the children of Israel were engaged in doing, and slavery was part of those evils? Do you think God would have had his prophets condemn slavery as well? Oh, yes. By, by all means, he would have. But the fact that it's silent, there's no statements made, I believe indicates that Israel obeyed God and they did not practice uh, slavery in their land. And when we come to the New Testament, we find neither did Jesus nor the apostles approve of or condone slavery at all. They understood that mankind is so fallen into sin that no man can be trusted with unchecked power over his fellow man. That is God's standard. And we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, when we read what the Scriptures clearly say, we understand there is no biblical defense for slavery. It is against what God designed. It is not what He planned at all for mankind. And instead, what He planned for us is that we would enjoy the glorious liberty of the children of God. That's God's plan for us. During some very dark days in Italy, the uh, uh, fight for liberty was taking place. And most people recognized that their current oppressive government was not going to give them liberty at all. And they had hope. Their hope was dependent on one man, Garibaldi, who they believed would be their liberator. Indeed, prisoners who were uh, hurried off to their loathsome dungeons, they'd be encouraged by those they passed along the streets by whispering, friends whispering in their ear, take courage. Garibaldi is coming. Men would steal out into the night and take chalk and write on the streets and write on the walls, Garibaldi is coming. And when the news of his approach to the city was announced, the people would shout, Garibaldi is coming. And indeed, he came and he conquered the city and he set them free. They regained their freedom and they would never be made slaves again. But my friends, someone far greater than Garibaldi is coming. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming as He promised and He will set 
everything right. He will destroy all those systems of oppression and evil in this world. And indeed, he told us when he came to preach the gospel, he came to set the captives free. Yes, free from their own personal bondage to sin and to, de and to the works of the devil, but also to set families free and to set whole cultures free if they would but follow his holy word. You see, as bearers of that good news, we, like Christ, bring that word of freedom to the world, that word of redemption to the lost. And so let us proclaim the glorious liberty of the sons of God to those who are in bondage, to those who are in despair. Let us go, my friends, and set the captives free. Let's